Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray for you to work here this morning. By your spirit, we pray that you give life where there's none. Lord, teach us precious truths from the text of uh, Philippians 2. We pray, Lord, that uh, you help us to submit under Jesus and show us um, his ways. We pray, Lord, uh, that in doing so, you would make us more and more like Christ. In his name, amen. It is good to be here this morning, Ocean Park. As I do each week, I want to make sure you know that A, I love you, uh, but more importantly, Jesus loves us. And uh, we can open up God's word and by the power of the Holy Spirit that was working us, be guided in truth to come to understand that, uh, knowledge that Jesus loves us and that we can grow in the love and likeness of Jesus. Have you ever heard somebody say, do you know who I am? How many times have maybe a politician, a celebrity, a businessman, when they got caught with their hands in the cookie jar and they want the, to get their own way, have played that, uh, said that? And they appeal to their position, their prestige, their power to exempt themselves from the regular circumstances of life that uh, normal people experience. And honestly, it probably, when you hear that, it makes you really, really angry because inherently they're no different than you and I because of their fancy clothes, their fat bank accounts, their Instagram followers, or their gated communities. However, if there was any person who could actually say, do you know who I am, that person would have been Jesus. If you, before we, keep your finger where we are, but I want you to turn over probably a page, maybe two, to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Paul wrote Colossians before he wrote Ephesians, and Colossians is a um, deeply Christocentric, Christ-centered book. And verses 15 through 20 show this glory of Jesus. I want to read it to you and then hear the words, do you know who I am? He is the image, Jesus, of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. In other words, he is the highest of honors. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in everything he might be preeminent, he might be first. He might be foremost. For in him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. Amen? There is no one on earth who compares to the greatness of of Jesus, or as the foremost 1990 theologian's audio adrenaline says, uh, shout out to Gen X, no one is as big as Jesus. 
Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Jesus, in his deity, is Emmanuel, God with us, worthy of our glory and majesty and dominion and authority forever and ever, all, amen. Jude 24 and 25, that I say as a benediction. In his deity, he is the perfect human, fulfilling God's perfect design for mankind, loving the Lord with all his heart and unloving his neighbor as himself. Jesus is the one person in all of creation who could say, do you know who I am? And be completely justified. But such words were never uttered from his lips. Why? The humble heart of Jesus. The humble heart of Jesus that does not grasp for what, uh, for more to take and take and take, but the heart that continually seeks to give and give and give. And this is why Paul, in back in our, uh, as we get back to Philippians chapter one, verse or ch- two, verse five, he says this: "Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus." Christians. Those who have been born again, who are united by faith to Jesus, are called to look at themselves the way Jesus looked at himself. Not seeking to selfishly consume more and more and be all about themselves, but to live in such a way that you give and give and give that others, that the body of Christ is built up and strengthened. So with that being said, my big idea is this. The humble mind of Christ is the mind of his people. The humble mind of Christ is the mind of his people. And if there is something that is countercultural to the 21st century church in America, the humble mind of Christ is probably it to our shame. And this is where we need to allow ourselves to saturate in the text and to look at it, for it is glorious because it shows us Jesus. Six months ago during Advent, I preached this same text, but my focus was on the incarnation. The glory of Jesus coming incarnate, in flesh. But now what I want to do is look at it. I want to turn that diamond and look at a different facet uh, in a different light to see the mind of Jesus. Because Paul tells us the mind of Jesus is to be our mindset. How we look at ourselves and our neighbor, our brothers and sisters, and how we look to the world. So we want to see the mind of Jesus. So we can put that into practice and then pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, help me be like Jesus in everything I do and everything I say and everything I am. Three ways uh, that I want to just break it up here. One is self-denying service, self-denying service. Two, wholehearted obedience, wholehearted obedience. And then finally, faithful trust faithful trust. So the humble mind of Christ is the mind of his people, and three aspects of the many are seen this way, in self-denying service, in wholehearted obedience, and in faithful trust. And the way I want to do that is I want to, on each one of these points, to show you the mind of Christ to the best of my ability, uh, empowered prayerfully by the Holy Spirit, show you the mind of Christ and then present to you what we as Christians should be doing. So we want to look at the mind of Christ and then the mind of Christians as we look at service, obedience, and trust. So let's look at this first aspect, self-denying service, which means Christians 
don't exploit their standings in this world to their advantage. Instead, like Jesus, we give ourselves in self-denying service. Let's look at this first idea from verses 6 and 7, the mind of Christ. Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not uh, count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, in being born in the likeness of men. See, the greatness of Jesus was demonstrated not in his signs and wonders, not simply on the cross, not even the resurrection, but the greatness of Jesus was demonstrated on how low he was willing to go to rescue his people from the depths of their sin and their hopelessness. He left the lofty heights of glory, his rightful and true environment to live and to act and to function as a servant in a dark and broken world. And if anybody had uh, the right to demand proper treatment as equal with God and demand that he be treated the way he is, it was Jesus. But he didn't do that. He didn't think it a thing to be grasped, a thing to be demanded. You need to treat me like this. Do you know who I am? If you did, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. He he didn't exploit his divine status for personal benefits. He didn't demand his rights as God in flesh, Emmanuel. He didn't play the God card, if you will. All of which he would have been completely justified in doing so. Jesus had the right to everything, but he demanded nothing. So he could become a servant to a fallen, helpless people. Why? To save them from their sins. In the ancient Greeks, you see the Greek gods, Crosby and I have read some of the Percy Jackson series, some of the uh, actual writings of of the first century Greeks, and when the gods came down, they were uh, self-serving, self-indulgent, self-loving, and if a human crossed them, the, the Iliad and Odyssey are pretty much, if you made the gods angry, I'm going to kill him. And I'm going to get revenge for what you have done. But not the Son of God. Notice what he does. Jesus says, the Son of Man, the title that he used for himself that comes from the book of Daniel, came not to be served like Zeus. And I might blank on all the other ones. Hades and their ilk. Poseidon, apparently Brandon's favorite. Um, Not to be served, but to serve. And not only to be a servant, but to the point that to give his life as a ransom for many. Nothing obligated Jesus to come and rescue us. Nothing required Jesus to become a servant. In fact, everything demanded the very opposite of that. The world should have served Jesus if they recognized who he was. But instead, Jesus served the world that God so loved, that he sent Jesus willingly to rescue them from their sin. The humble mind of Jesus refused to cling, to grasp to, to hold on to, demand his rightful glory. The mind of Christ was the motivation to let go of his mindful glory. It's not just simply how far Jesus went to save us, how, but his very heart, his divinity, was the reason that he came. D.A. Carson puts it like this. He says, The eternal Son of God did not think of his status of God as something that gave him the opportunity to get and to get and to get. Do you know who I am? You should start treating me that way. 
No, he says instead his very status as God meant he had nothing to prove, nothing to achieve. And precisely because Jesus is one with God, one with this kind of God, he made himself nothing, a very servant. And he gave, and he gave, and he gave. It was not despite Christ's deity that he took on the form of servant, but because of his deity, because of the heart of the triune God who so loves his creation that drove him to save them because nobody else could. Only God could save his people from their sin. He did not drain himself of deity. He didn't stop becoming God. No, he let go of all his rights. Some of you might have the NIV, and it says he made himself nothing. Jesus didn't drain himself of his deity. He added a human nature. The eternal son of God has always been the son of God. But at at Bethlehem, he became a human and put on human flesh. This is what Charles Wesley, in a little bit we're going to sing, talks about the eternal God becoming the incarnate God. He became Emmanuel, God with us, fully God and fully man. Amazing, the grace and love of God. And he says, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? I was the one who did it, and he died for it. For me, whom him to death pursued. And then the chorus says, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, humbled himself to show his love. And the God who so loved the world sent his only son and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all immense and free. For oh my God. It found out me. Oshabark, when we realize that Jesus left the glories of heaven. To live in the dark slum of sin. Where we are. And to save us by emptying himself of his due glory. It's mind blowing. So how do we respond? How do we put this mind of Jesus on? Because we're not God. We're not perfect. We're not a glorious man as Jesus is. But we can share in this truth. When we begin to see ourselves as Jesus saw himself. And we don't let this incarnation become a useless set of trivia, but something that saturates and that we steep our heart in until it begins to soak up the grace that we see in Jesus. Because if this is true, and many of you are here because you believe this, if this is true, If Jesus left the glories of heaven as a servant to redeem you and me from our sins, if he refused to demand his rights, his fair share, his due, but gave and gave and gave of himself, we are called to do the same. Yet we live in a world that constantly tells us to live for who? For ourselves to protect our rights, to pursue your passions and dreams, to follow your heart, to grasp for wealth and glamour and power and prestige and beauty and pleasure and comfort and amusement. We live in a country that's built on the American dream that tells us that our fundamental rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And who defines that? We do. But the gospel comes in and says, whoever would be great must be your servant. 
and whoever must be first among you must, must be your slave. You see, the constitution of the kingdom of God is radically different than the Bill of Rights that we as Americans love and treasured and have built our great nation. But we have to realize we live in tension between two kingdoms and our citizenship, though it is in the United States and it's a wonderful country, our greater citizenship, our eternal citizenship, is in the kingdom of heaven that was won by the blood of Christ, the eternal God who came in flesh. And if we are saved, brothers and sisters, by grace alone, by Jesus leaving his rightful place to become a servant, there is nothing that he can't call us to do, and there is nothing that we must not be willing to do. We humble ourselves and we become servants to one another, to our neighbors, to our friends, our families. We give to others the grace, the unmerited favor of God that we have given to them. We live in a world that says cut off toxic people. And I understand that. And, there, there's, and listen, it's a much bigger conversation and story. But the gospel runs so counter. Because if that was true, John 3.16 wouldn't exist. Because it, for God so loved a toxic world that psychology would have said, eh, just stay in heaven, Lord. It's so much better up here. Have you seen what they've done to our very good world? But God so loved. And he became incarnational. And as when we put on the mind of Christ, we roll up our sleeves and we involve ourselves in the messy lives of others. Now, there's wisdom that has to happen. And, and that's a, a pastoral conversation that we can have. But we stop living for ourselves and we live for Christ by being servants to those around us. In our homes, in our work, in our families, in our neighborhoods. Because we don't exploit our standing to our advantage. I am a child of God. I will not have anything to do with you peons. No, but like Jesus who says, I am God. And he rolled up his sleeves and he moved in to love us and redeem us. It's the humble mind of Christ which is to be the mind of his people. And therefore, we put on self-denying service and wholehearted obedience. See, Christians submit themselves to the will of their heavenly Father as Jesus, the Son, submitted himself to the will of the Father in redemption. The will of the triune God who before the foundation of the earth, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in perfect conjunction and harmony with one another, said we will rescue these people from their sin. And how will we do it? The Son will come and become one of them to lead them out by his sacrifice and his resurrection and his gra in our grace. So verse 8, you see, and being found in human form... Is, he was uh, God, but he was willing to serve. And now in a human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. As God, Jesus had held nothing back by becoming a servant. And as a human, Jesus held nothing back by becoming obedient to the plan of redemption, even to the point of dying. You see, uh, theologically, you see the active obedience of Jesus. Jesus fulfilled God's righteousness, a.k.a. the law. He loved the Lord with all his heart and soul and mind, and he loved his neighbor as himself. Jesus did everything that the Father called him to do and was everything that the ca Father called him to be. He was perfect. He was, or you could say, righteous. He was spotless. He was without blemish. That, blemish. that was his active obedience. But you also see Jesus' passive obedience. Jesus perfectly obeyed the Father by willingly laying down his life and dying as an atoning sacrifice for his people. Jesus willingly gave up his life to set 
his people free from the bondage of sin. Jesus stood in their place and took their punishment and allowed himself to be betrayed and condemned and whipped and humiliated and to die. Something he had no right doing. But he died to fulfill the plan of righteousness. And this is why in Paul, in Paul says in, at the end of 8, even death on a cross. I don't think we can really comprehend how absolutely reprehensible death on a cross was in the Roman Empire. Some of you literally have crosses tattooed on your skin as an uh, a expression of your faith. Uh, some of us hang golden crosses or silver crosses around our neck or earrings or something like that. We decorate our homes and our churches with crosses. But in the first century, in the Roman Empire, in those years uh, before and after Christ, the cross was neither beautiful nor was it honorable. But it was absolutely horrific. Eliciting the shocks of such places like German concentration camps, the Russian gulag, the Cambodian killing fields, the antebellum south lynching trees. Cicero, who lived about 100 years before Jesus, called the cross so horrible it was not, uh, could not even be mentioned in polite society. Crucifixion could never be given to a Roman citizen, but it was actually re re reserved for slaves and criminals and enemies of the state. The cross was so appalling, nobody willingly signed up for it except the glorious king of glory, Jesus. Why? He perfectly submitted himself and willingly submitted himself to the Father's will to save his people. You see this in Isaiah 53. Surely he, the suffering servant who promises and is fulfilled in Jesus, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. It was the will of the Lord... You could say it was will of the Father to crush the servant, the Son. And Jesus, in his perfect passive obedience, because of his righteous obedience of his heart, made an offering for guilt. And he sees his offering and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. Something we cannot on our own. And he shall bear their iniquities. The plan of the triune God from eternity past was to redeem a people from the sin. The Father declared it. The Son willingly laid down His life. And the Spirit applies it to our hearts. Jesus' obedience was unconditional and unlimited. It went as far as it could to the very end of His life. And as far as His death, not even in the death of the King of glory, did He choose His end. But he prayed with full knowledge of what was to come at Calvary. Not my will, but yours be done. If there's any other way we can save these people, let's do it. But not my will, but yours be done. But what is the mind of Christians that we are to put on as, from the mind of Christ? Let me tell you this. To follow Jesus, you cannot dictate the terms. 
The obedience of Jesus is the obedience of the Christian. Even when obedience is costly and is painful, and quite honestly, we don't want to do it. Jesus did not want to die the way he did, but he willingly offered his life in perfect obedience. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus says, just as I laid down my life, so you're called to do it as well. Jesus said to them, to the crowds, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. That horrific implement of shame and death daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Submitting our will to Christ is the most unnatural thing that our flesh will do because we want to be in charge. That's the nature of sin. We do, we, we do what we want, when we want it, whenever we want. But that's not the mind of Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, the great uh, German pastor in World War, said is this, as we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. Just as the Son submitted to the plan of the Father, we submit to Christ. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins, the cross is not a, the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us in the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And Bonhoeffer uses the example of the disciples who left their lives on the shores and uh, followed Jesus. He uses Luther who left the comforts and the protection of the monastery and followed Jesus for the rest of his life. It's not obedience out of drudgery. Obedience is death, but it's not loss. It's an invitation to commune with Christ, which is greater. It's an invitation to joy in Christ. Our fa Heavenly Father knows us and he loves us. And he calls us to complete surrender and obedience because he knows what's best for us. He created us and he knows that the functional saviors, the counterfeit gods, and the idols of our heart are destroying us. As Jeremiah says, my people have committed two sins. They have uh, forsaken the, the, the infinite God and they have dug for themselves cisterns, sources of water, cisterns that hold no water. We've chased after idols that cannot satisfy us when infinite satisfaction in life in Christ is offered to us. Our Heavenly Father, but this is not just like submit and just do what I, what I tell you to do. Jesus knows. Because for, from life to death, he perfectly submitted in wholehearted obedience to the will of the Father. And because Jesus did it, and because he sent his spirit into our heart, we can look to Jesus for our needs. Many of you know Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all these faithful brothers and sisters who have gone ahead, let us lay beside every weight and sin that which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And how do we do that? Not by our own strength, but we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith and the example of Jesus, who for joy, joy, not obligation, not out of duty, not begrudgingly, but for joy that was set before him. What was that joy? To redeem a people for himself for all eternity, to dwell with the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit in the kingdom of God. That was the joy he knew in the horizon. He endured and faithfully obeyed the Father's will at the cross, despising the shame. It wasn't some sick reason that he did all of this. He despised it, but for the joy of redeeming a people for himself. And now 
He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And later, earlier, or later, somewhere in Hebrews, it says, and he prays for us and he sends us what we need. Amen? All right, come on, people. This is good stuff. Take heart. This process of sanctification, being cut more and more like Jesus by his grace, is difficult at times. Crucifying self is completely unnatural. But the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit who lives in you will give you the strength to put to death self in wholehearted obedience and to put on the mind of Christ. We just need to ask. As James says, you have not because you ask not. When is the last time you said, Lord, I'm struggling to be like Jesus. I need your help. It's so easy to sin. I remember when Anne was little, maybe three or four, and she had done something wrong, and these big tears are crying, coming down her face, and she says, Daddy, Mommy, it's so easy to do bad things. But the gospel is great and sweet and powerful to make us more like Jesus, to give us the humble mind of Christ the humble mind of Christ is the mind of his people. We serve uh, others as self-denying service, wholehearted obedience, and very quickly, faithful trust. And I hate going through these verses very quickly, but you can go on YouTube mid-December, and I elaborated on them there. But there is a, a level that Jesus trusted the Heavenly Father and was exalted. And we are called to do the same. When it looks like Things aren't going well. Christians are called to trust the Father to fulfill his promises in redemption. This was demonstrated on the Calvary when Jesus laid down his life and he committed his life to the Father. And now he calls us to do the same. The mind of Christ says that on the cross, the Father did not abandon the Son. The Father never stopped loving the Son. The Father watched in excruciating silence as the Son in His humanity cried out from Psalms, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why was the Father silent in the Son's greatest need? Our redemption. Our redemption. And so when Jesus said, it is finished, the price of our sin was paid because he trusted the Father. And he went into the grave. Not forever. Three days later, the Father's promises were uh, enacted and Jesus arose. And Jesus ascended and it sits at the right hand of the Father. The mind of Jesus is a mind that trusts the heart of the Father. So much so that he left the glories of heaven, submitted to death on a cross. He risked it all because he trusted the Father. And what is the result? God has highly, verse 9, exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. What is that? A little later, you'll see that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and tongue confess on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Hebrew name Yahweh, the holy name of God, has been now given to Jesus. Or not given to Jesus, has been revealed to be Jesus. He's been exalted to the Father's right hand, that place of glory, the uh, man, uh, um, man of sorrows, the one that people spit and mocked and wagged their heads at him. Now that man sits at the Father's right hand because he faithfully trusted the, his Father. My father, my, my earthly dad, Jim, uh, read out of Isaiah 45 this morning. In the story of Israel, God's people who are in bondage to their sin and uh, being sent into captivity, but the promise is that I will, if you trust me, deliver you. But he told them in Isaiah 42 leading up to it, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other. 
nor my praise to carved idols. And then he says to God's people, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from out of my mouth have gone righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me alone every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. Do you hear that? Do you hear that one Paul says? Paul is picking up the richness of the promises of God in Isaiah and saying that Jesus has the last word. He is vindicated in the end. No Roman Empire, no religious leader, no uh, criminal can hold stand against him. His abject servanthood gives him immediate lordship. His vindication is in seen when the Father calls him Lord. Now and when he returns. What is the mind of Christians in this? Because none of us will sit at the Father's right hand. None of us are God in flesh. But the mind of Christians is just as Christ was exalted to the Father's hand... He's not the only one who will be vindicated on that final day. All who have died in faith and their bodies have been buried will rise again to newness of life as the resurrection and be brought into the kingdom of God. Those who the world has hated will be blessed by the Father. We look at this verse as Christians and we realize we have a hope that is coming. An eschatological hope, a big fancy word of saying, this is the plan of redemption, how it will turn out in the end. And though today the world views those who belong to Jesus as fools, the world deems their sacrifice a waste, and though they are hated on account of Christ who lives with them, they will be vindicated on that final day because the Lord will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I knew you and brings you in to the kingdom, not because you have lived worthy lives, because you are united to Jesus. Blessed are those, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of uh, evil against you on my account, rejoice and be glad. Or as Paul says, have, have, have joy, for great is your reward in heaven. They persecuted the prophets who were before you, the faithful people of God who trusted in the promises of him. Ocean Park, there is a day the world can do whatever they want, but it matters what Jesus says. He is the one who has been vindicated and there will be a day when we are vindicated. We just sang this. What a foretaste, looking at the, at the resurrection, what a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope, Christ in power resurrected. That thing that we celebrate on Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, as we will be when he comes. Jesus has been vindicated because he has been raised out of the tomb and he has been ascended into heaven and put at the highest place of honor. He's returned to his glory. But now, not just a glory that was hidden before time, but a glory that is being brilliantly shined through creation. Will you put on the mind of Christ, which denies ourselves to serve? Will you submit to the Father in complete obedience, trusting that His way is a way of joy and peace and truth? Will you faithfully trust the Father's plan in redemption? Pray for the grace today to do that. Because every day we wake up, we forget these promises. And it doesn't come natural. And we need to repent and believe. Some of you may have not ever heard this before. And you have to come to a place where you repent. You turn away. You renounce. You abdicate the throne of your heart. And you stop living for yourself. Stop serving yourself. And stop only trusting yourself. Scripture calls that sin. 
and rebellion against the sovereign king of heaven. But it's not enough just to say, okay, that my bad. But it says repent and believe. Trust the promises of God that joy and peace and life is found in Christ. Who he is and what he's done. And that by following his example, serving others, submitting yourself in joyful obedience, trusting the Father's will, that Jesus' completed work on the cross brings life to all who are united by faith, can have life and have a place where they belong in the Father's kingdom. Isn't that what we want? Cheers, the great sitcom... And most time, Baptist pastors don't quote cheers in their sermons. But you know the theme song. Sometimes you want to go where everyone knows your name. That's the heart. That's the heart of the kingdom. We want a place where we can belong. And we scurry and chase after all kinds of things. Trying to find joy in a place to belong. In the promises of the world that leave us... uh, uh, hungry and thirsty like salt water to the soul, but there is a place in communion with Jesus where we find joy and life and a place where we belong because of Jesus. Because he left his Father's glory above, submitted himself in perfect obedience, trusting the Father, and was vindicated. And all who trust in who Jesus is and what he has done and turn from their own self-reliance will have that joy and the privilege to serve the humble mind of Christ out in the the lives of his people. May that be our joy, is to know Christ and to make him known. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today Words are not sufficient for the greatness of Jesus who did not grasp what was due his, but he humbled himself to show his self-sacrificial love and to give of himself that we may have life. May we be amazed by his love and serve and make him known to the day that you call us home or the day you return. In Christ's precious and holy name we pray, amen.